Good, good, good. Appreciate y'all coming out tonight for a Bible study. And uh, we got several that have stayed home tonight so that they wouldn't share the love, and we appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> several that are recovering, several that are dealing with it afresh and anew, and um, we're going to pray for them in just a moment. But before we do, uh, let me remind you of what we've got going on for the rest of the week. That's not this week. That's next Saturday, a week from Saturday. Uh, we're having a work day here at the church. I, matter of fact, I ordered a dumpster today so we can get rid of some, some junk. So if you can help us on that Saturday at 9 a.m., uh, love for you to be here and, and uh, lend a hand, try to get as much cleaned up as we can uh, next Saturday. I don't understand sign language happening right now. Yes, I've already talked to the men. We're good to go. All right. It's easy enough. <laughs> she about thought she was a mime in a box or something. <laughs> For those watching online, I'm sorry. My wife's making me hand motions back there. And I didn't understand what she was saying. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, we're, uh, we're able to go to the, if you wanted to call it a funeral, it was more like a worship service today uh, for Fred and uh, just a great time of celebrating his life uh, with his family, and we thank the Lord for that. But continue to remember Ravina. She's having a really hard time with this, as expected, and uh, more pray for her that God would touch her and minister her. Also, uh, Tommy Burke passed away. Uh, this is um, the uncle of a lady that works with me at uh, FedEx. She texted me right before service and asked us to be praying for her family as they travel for the funeral. Also, she has a friend named Nakia Moscatello, I guess I'm saying that right, who is scheduled for heart surgery tomorrow. So please remember uh, Nakia. Nancy's at home sick tonight. Please remember her. Uh, continue to remember uh, Sue's brother Steve uh, for healing for him. Uh, any update on Ronnie? Two weeks. Okay. So uh, gives God two weeks to do his thing. So remember them. Remember David Franklin for salvation. A little Amaru is still uh, sick. So remember Amaru. Uh, Derek Livingston, who's uh, dealing with cancer. Uh, also, Violet Moody. You got an update on Miss Violet? Wow. Okay. All right. So, she may have a leakage in her bowel. So, remember uh, Miss Violet, that God would touch her. Continue to remember Amy. Uh, she's dealing with breast cancer. Uh, Matt's MRI results came back clean. Uh, nothing there. So, uh, as as per doctors, uh, they're going to keep testing because they want to find something. That's why they call it practice. All right? So uh, uh, continue to remember Matt. Uh, Kim, you got an update on Kim, Sister Jeanette? Yeah. Oh, boy. I'm all the coughing. Yeah. So remember Kim. She's at home but uh, is uh, recovering. Pray for her. Joe's also at home uh, recovering. So remember Joe. Susan's on the back end of the flu uh, trying to get over it. Uh, so they, they said she does not have pneumonia, but she is uh, trying to get over the flu. So remember uh, Susan. Uh, continue to remember Jerry, uh, that God would touch and minister him. Uh, also uh, uh, Jobin. Uh, this is the uh, young man that's doing with uh, flu and pneumonia. Uh, Sharon. Uh, this is a friend of yours, right, Brandon? Is that right? Sharon? Co-worker's friend. Okay. Who's dealing with some numbness. Remember, uh, Sharon, if you will. Charlotte Houck uh, is dealing with thyroid issues. Uh, Mike uh, McFarlane uh, still dealing with cancer, so continue to remember him. And uh, Frank's sick again. He's feeling better. Okay. So we take Frank off, Trace. He's feeling better. All the Russells except for Sam are sick. Major, Rhonda, and uh, Beth are all three sick. So uh, uh, they, she sent me a message today and said that they've come down with this stuff and they're at home and they're going to stay home and recover. So remember the Russell family and uh, pray especially for Sam <laughs> that she don't get it. So uh, that, that's, that can be tough. Uh, it just seems like it, when it gets in the house, they just pass it around. And uh, Carmen and Michael uh, dealt with it. I think they're feeling better. They, they were back to work this week. So uh, they all just passed it around in that house and uh, I, I stayed away like they were the plague. 
I, I don't care to have that stuff. Don't, don't, don't desire it. I was very careful when I went to the hospital to visit. I put the mask on and sanitized and did everything I could do to make sure that I didn't have anything to attribute to me getting it. Uh, so I, I still have my responsibility as a pastor, but at the same time, I still got responsibility as a human being. <laughs> I don't want to suffer. So uh, anyway, continue to pray for these. And um, I know there's probably quite a few more that we could be praying for or should be praying for uh, that God would touch them and minister them. Uh, remember uh, Trudy Perkins, who's dealing with cancer, and then uh, uh, Malin, who's dealing with uh, fever and pink eye, a uh, little baby Malin. So remember uh, Malin that God would touch. This is uh, Heather's daughter, Malin? Okay. Yeah, uh, Heather's little girl. She's dealing with fever may have pink eye. A lot going on. This may not mean much to you, but uh, Victor's uh, got a dog that he's had 17 years now, I guess, Bear. And uh, me and Bear's good buddies. But uh, Bear's not doing too well right now. And um, uh, he, he's uh, really worried about it. He's not eating. And uh, so I want to uh, pray for uh, little Bear tonight also that God would touch him. Some people say, well, that's foolish. Well, if it was your animal and you're as close as you are to him, you, you, you would you would want to remember him too. So uh, we, we just want to pray for God to, to, to touch that, that baby and uh, minister to that puppy and that God would minister to that dog's life. All right? God's faithful. He knows what we have need of even before we ask it. And while we're asking, the answer's on the way. So we've made our request known, and we know that God's faithful to perform that which we've asked him to do. He's a good God. Amen? Amen. If you would, let's stand, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to jump right into the Scripture tonight. And uh, we're moving to the third chapter tonight. We're going to pick up with the church at Sardis. Uh, but before we do, let's pray over these needs and requests. And ask God to have his way. Father, we love you so much. Thank you once again for the opportunity that you've given us to come into your house, the opportunity to call upon your name. God, you've been so faithful to us, so good to us, Lord. We can never thank you enough for the great things that you've done. I just thank you tonight, God, that you've ministered and comforted and strengthened families. And, God, that you've spoken to hearts and lives. God, I thank you for what you did today in the Delegar family, God, and what you're going to continue to do to touch Ravina and the family, Lord, and Sue and her brothers and sisters. We just pray that you continue to minister to them and strengthen them as they're uh, dealing with the, the loss of Fred and also Steve and his sickness, Lord, that he's fighting with. I just pray, God, that you would bring healing in his body and comfort and strength to this family. God, we pray for our church family tonight, God. We've got so many that are dealing with this sickness. We pray for Sue, Susan and Joe, and we pray for uh, Kim tonight. We pray for uh, the Russell family, Lord, that you minister healing to them. Touch Heather's daughter, Malin, tonight, God. Pray that you minister to them. Touch Nancy and Matt, God. Bring healing to their body, total healing. We pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that you'd minister to him in your name, God. I thank you for what you're doing. We pray for Mike tonight, God, that you would heal him of this cancer. And Amy, God, of the breast cancer, Lord, we pray that you'd heal them and make them whole. In the name of Jesus. Father, for uh, these other needs, these families that are dealing with loss tonight, for the Burke family, I pray that you administer them and strengthen them. Give them traveling mercies, God, as they travel to be uh, together as a family to uh, lay him to rest, God. I pray that you would touch this young lady, Nakia, that will be having heart surgery tomorrow, God. I pray that you would uh, work in that situation, God, and that you would do a work in her body, God, that you would touch the surgeons, physicians, all those that are working in this situation, God, that you bring healing to her body in Jesus' name. Touch Jerry tonight. Heal him, God, of this tumor that's in his kidney. I pray that you would heal him and make him whole in the name of Jesus. Lord, one request that we failed to mention, uh, Terry's sister Sandra's back in the hospital, God, and we just pray that you would touch her and minister to her. Lord, uh, it's, it's just an up and down situation with her, and we just pray, God, that you would minister to her in the name of Jesus. For all the other needs and requests, God, that are represented across this room, for Stephanie's grandmother, Lord, as she's dealing with this situation with her bowel, God, I pray that you would bring uh, total healing to her body. We prayed for it. We believe in for it. And we're going to continue to believe and ask for it, God. I pray in the name of Jesus that your will be done in her life. God, that your name be glorified. We're believing you for that, Jesus. Father, we praise you for what you're doing. We praise you for what you're about to do. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise for the great things that you have done and the great things that you're doing in our lives, God, and the places that you're taking us to. We rejoice in you. And we just give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. If you want to grab your Bibles, turn with me to Revelations chapter 3. Revelations chapter 3. The Bible said, To the angel of the church is Sardis right. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. 
I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, I add your blessing to your word. Bless the hearers of the hearers, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right, you can be seated. All right, so we're talking about the church at Sardis, but before we do, let's again just kind of give you some history uh, as it pertains to Sardis. This town, uh, this city uh, was a very wealthy town, had a lot of wealthy people that lived there, a lot of people of prominence that lived there. Uh, One guy by the name of Croesus lived there and reigned. Uh, uh, The wise Thales and Cleobulus and Solon had their homes there. On the plains around it once lay the host of Xerxes, and on their way to find a sepulcher at Marathon, one writer wrote about Sardis. It was a rich and glorious city when Cyrus conquered it. It obtained considerable distinction under the Romans during the reign of Tiberius. Among the ruins of the city, Artemis' magnificent temple of the 4th century B.C. survives in part, as well as the adjacent Christian church from the 4th century A.D. So this was kind of a hub of religion, a hub of a place of worship, if you will, that was in that particular place. But the Scripture goes on to tell us how they were and who they were. And so the spiritual characteristic of this church period, (laughs) as we've been talking about, in these particular different church ages, that was it was an age of separation and also an age to the return to the rule of Christ. And so we see what's taking place here is this age of comparative freedom from Balaam, his doctrines, from the Nicolaitans and their tenants, from Jezebel and their fornications. Remember, all the way up through uh, to this point, we've talked about all these different doctrines, these deeds that have been taking place in the different churches. We talked about how Jezebel was present in the prior church that we talked about, how that he had gave, God had gave her space to repent, but she wouldn't repent. How all these things leading up to this particular church age. Now we're beginning to see a, a, a change, a switch, if you will, where, where God is really beginning to deal from a judgment type atmosphere. He's beginning to deal with those people that have turned away from Him, but yet the blessing is still on those people that are true to Him, that are serving Him. So this is an age of freedom from these different doctrines. It was an age containing many worthy names and, and having much of which to repent. It was an age covering the spiritual lethargy of the Protestant system centuries before the great evangelical movements of the last hundred years. The date of this period was from about A.D. 1500 all the way up to about A.D. 1750. Now, we'll get into, into it just a little bit more, but there were some great theologians, some great men of God that came up through this time. There were some great revivals that took place in this time period. The Welsh Revival fell in this time period. Some other great moves of God that took place on the earth fell in this particular time period. And so we, we see how God moved. We see how God ministered and manifested His glory, His presence, His power, and He began to speak to men to transform them into a place of beginning to walk by faith faith, not by sight, to begin to transform them, help them to understand what it is that God had called them to do. And so let's, let's go straight into the scriptures tonight and begin to look at uh, what, what God was saying to this church of Sardis. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, there is a description of Christ, and the Bible said, unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. And so before we go any further, I want you to look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. Now we've covered this, but I want you to see what the scripture said. John said to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now remember, we talked about these spirits, the ministering spirits that were ministering in the presence of God. But also we talked about how they equal to ministers within those particular churches, how that God had the stars amongst the, 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 the seven stars that were there. In Revelation 1 and 16, it also talks about this. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Now, if you remember in Revelation 1, we talked about how that Jesus was holding the ministers, how that Jesus was holding the men and the women of God that 
that were ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ, how that God was holding him. And so when Jesus describes himself, he says, I've got the seven spirits of God. I've got the seven stars. I'm holding them. I hold them in my grasp. And so Jesus wants them to understand that I am here in the midst of this church. I am here and I'm holding you. I am, I am embracing you. I'm, I'm wanting to know that I'm compelling you to want to come forward and be what it is that I called you to be. Now remember, in all of these teachings, as we talk about all these different churches, that these churches were founded on great principles. But along the way, people began to indoctrinate them in ways. People began to do different deeds in them. They became different doctrines and different heresies, if you will, along the way. And so God now begins to turn the tide in this particular church age. He's trying to get them to steer away from what I would like to call the state church. And what I mean by that is, is, is within the church, if you're not careful, you can become so religious that you, you kind of spiritualize God right out of the equation. You understand what I'm saying? They, they, they had become so routine in what they were doing. They become so routine in how they were walking, how they were talking, all the different things they were doing. They become so routine that it becomes so monotonous what they were doing that God was not, I mean, to the point that God was not even allowed to move in the, in the, in the, in the services. God was not allowed to, to do it because they just so routine by the book, trying to get it done, do, the, do all the check boxes and all the things that they need to do and move forward. If we're not careful in the church today, we can get such a routine that we'll just we'll just spiritualize, if you will, God out of it. We'll do what, what we thought always worked. We'll do what mom and dad used to do. We'll do what everybody else used to do and just try to make it look like a service. And the Bible says that you'll have a form of godliness thereof, but deny the power thereof. We don't want to fall into that trap, folks. We don't want to fall into the trap of spiritualizing God out, that we get so spiritually minded and so overwhelmed with our religious ways that we just kind of push God. God right out of the equation. I don't want to fall into that trap. I was talking with a, ma a pastor friend of mine who was pastoring in Tennessee, and he and I were having this conversation. He said, Joy, he said, the church that I was at, he was an associate there. He said, the church that I was at, he said, I was so overwhelmed. I was so burdened for the church. He said, because every time God began to move, the pastor would sit up and stand up and literally talk it down. In other words, he didn't want God to move. He didn't want, they didn't want to allow God's spirit to move. They would literally talk it down. When people would begin to worship and praise God, they, and, and listen, ministers can do that kind of stuff. They know how to stand up and say the right thing to just kind of twist the, the the situation of the service. I don't want you. I want the freedom of God's presence to move in the house of God. I don't want to stop it. I want to. Stop, I want to see it manifest. I want to see the outpouring of the glory of God manifest His presence and His glory in such a powerful way. That's what my desire is. But here He's standing in this church. He said, "Listen, I, I, I want you to know that that you have this form of godliness. You're you're going through the routine. You look good on the outside." Jesus told the Pharisees, "You like white, white, whitewashed sepulchers. You know you." look good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. And so he goes on and begins, and we're going to skip a couple of verses and come back to them in just a moment. But he goes back to Revelations 3 and 4 and he begins to commend this church. He says, you've got a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. Look what he's saying now. He's saying, you got people within the church. you got people within Sardis. These people are worthy. These people, they've not defiled their garments, and they're going to walk with me in white. So you have these few names of these people who have not defiled their garments. These names are no doubt in that particular age from 1500 to 1750 A.D. These people were reformers. These were saints who braved the wrath of the woman Jezebel to preach justification by faith. You remember Martin Luther was in this time period. He said, that, he said as he was walking down that staircase, he heard the voice of God. God said, the just shall live by faith. And all of a sudden, this reformation period began to take place. And so we see these reformers that took place. The fundamental principles of the reformation were justification by faith, the individual priesthood of every believer, the Holy Scriptures as the final authority. These, there were men like John Huss and John Wycliffe and Martin Luther and John Calvin and Zwingli and others. The truth of these principles revived in the hearts of the people. The state church or the, 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 the 
the, the, the church that had, uh, you know, kind of made up this religious uh, moment of that particular time. This, this particular church started a bloodbath. There, there, used to, there was wars and there was killings and there was, uh, there was uh, uh, martyrs that took place in this time. Literally a bloodbath that equaled or surpassed that of imperial Rome in, let, in letting the blood of believers. They, they, they filled the cup, as seen in Revelation 17, don't have this one, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus at this time. This cup would be completely filled with the blood of Christians for she will murder in the near future when she sits as queen and in st- the state church in the beast empire. The Waldenese, the Albigenese, Al- the Huguenots, and thousands of others died at the hands of this church rather than give up their justification by faith. They said we're not surrendering ourselves to your ways. We're not surrendering ourselves to your man-made religion. We're not surrendering ourselves to your edicts or what you're trying to lay out. We're going to stand with God. We're going to stand with the principles of the Word of God. We're going to stand with what God has told us to do. We're going to stand by faith, not by sight. We're going to stand with the things of God that bring glory and honor to Him, not glory and honor to man. And see, we can fall into that trap, but we don't want to go there. And so this, this, this falling into the hands of this church, they said, listen, we would rather die than yield to these edicts of men. Satan, by means of this wholesale slaughter, stopped the Reformation period from traveling any farther. They, he, he literally stopped it and going into any other countries. But yet God is going to reward those people that stood with him in that day. God promised in chapter 17 and 18, and we'll get to it later, but John, God promised in those times that those that stood, those that were faithful, those that believed God and, and held fast to the truth of God's word, God was going to reward them in the last day. In our day, and what we're dealing with and what we're up against, the heresies that traveled throughout the churches, the, the compromise, the materialism, the worldliness that cr- travels through the churches. If we'll stand true to the Word of God, we'll stand true to the things of God, there'll come a day when we'll hear Him declare, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Listen, folks, you will not be in the majority when you really want to serve God. You will not be in the majority when you really want to live by the truth of God's Word. He says, straight and narrow is the gate, and few there be the find it. Don't you get disheartened when you're not gathered up by big crowds. Don't you get disheartened when you're not a part of the mega churches. Don't you get disheartened when it seems like there's just a few. God said, I take notice of even the few within the church that have been faithful to me. He said, listen, you've got a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, but God took notice of them. Listen, we might not get recognized by the world. We might not have our name put up on marquees, but God said, I see your life. I see your walk. I see what you're doing, not to defile yourself, and I'm taking notice of your life. Can somebody say amen? So to understand that God is doing this, that God is taking notice of the people of God as they serve Him with their life. But God in the church also has to deal in a judgmental type way where He rebukes this church. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, the latter part of the first verse. He said, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you're dead. Everybody says you're lively. Everybody says you got a great thing going on. Everybody says you got it together. Everybody loves your programs. But you're dead. You know, Sister Sheila went to a a, a revival service. Uh, This has been a couple of years ago. And she come back to me and she was so distraught about what she saw. She said, we felt like I was getting herded in like cattle. To herd us in, give us a few minutes of service, and then, you know, lead us out the doors and buy some tents and just talk to some people. And, and that, was their, that was their process. Got to get them in and get it out. You know, we, we, we've got titles for churches like that. They're seeker-sensitive churches. You know, the, 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 you know, we're living in such a chaotic and busy world that, that, that nobody has time to slow down and spend time with God. I was talking with Kim when she was up in the hospital. She and I were having the conversation, and I told her, I said, you know, uh, ministry's changed so much over the last 20-some years. I'm going into my 25th year of ministry this year, and, and you know, I, th- I think back over all the years of ministry and what I've been able to do and see and how that ministry just changed, how, how, how that the method of ministry, not, not, not the gospel now, not the word, not the truth, but the methods of ministry that have changed and how society has pulled at ministry and pulled at church and trying to get us to adapt to their methods. You know, it's almost like everything's fast these days. You know, even to the point that now you've got major retailers that are competing with one another 
to try to get it to you quicker. You got major companies like Amazon and Walmart that, that, that say, here, click on a few click of a buttons and, and you can get it the next day. I mean, that's, that's the way society is. And, and the danger of that is that, that gets in our mindset that all of a sudden now we're approaching God. Like we can click a couple of buttons, get a response, and get what we need immediately. I, I've come to learn in ministry that there's an element of tarrying. That there's an element of waiting on the Lord. That there's an element of being still and knowing that He's God. There's an element of saying, you know what, God, you might not answer me today and you might not answer me tomorrow, but I believe you to be still God. I know, God, that you're going to make a way. I know, God, that you're true to your word. I might have to stop and just recognize that in the midst of this trial that it might seem like you're a million miles away, but, God, you're true to your word, that you'll never leave me nor forsake me, but you'll be with me even to the end of the earth. I come to tell somebody tonight that God is faithful because he has promised in his word and God will do what he said he would do. He said, you seem to be alive, but you're dead. You're dead. I, I, I wonder, I wonder, and, and, and listen, I'm not pointing fingers because I, I, I would wonder what he would even say about Daystar. But I wonder if he was writing letters to the multitudes of churches within this, this, uh, this country. You know, what would he say? You know, would they, even, would they even read the letter? Would they even accept it to be from him? You know, I, I, I hear churches and ministries and, 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 and things a lot of times where, where people are even taking the Word of God and they're, they're twisting it to fit within their ideology and they're twisting it to fit within their lifestyle. And, and, and so if they're not even going to accept the unadulterated Word of God, then would they even hear a divine Word from God to put them back in line? You know, I, 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 I didn't get in this thing. To, to, to put up a front. I, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't start ministry here at Daystar just to put up a front and make everybody else out in the world say what a great job we're doing. Uh, Sister Sue's uh, nephew was at the funeral today, and, and, and he and I go way back. We've known each other a long time, and he put his arm around me and said, I heard some great things going on there at your church. I said, God is doing some great things. He said, I hear you growing. I hear you got a lot of people going over there. I said, well, I don't know where you heard that. I said, but there's some great things going on. Amen. Sometimes when you're going backwards, it might seem like things aren't going so great. But it's still God's in control and God's still great. Amen. So, so, so you, can, you can testify that even in what seems to be subtraction, God still works in addition. What, what seems to be division, God still has a process of multiplication. God has a way of taking little and making it much when you trust Him and know that God's going to make it. Listen, friend, I've been testifying about the goodness of God. How they, listen, I didn't get in this thing to try to build my kingdom or build my palaces or try to put out things to say this is mine or this is ours. I've been so much bragging on God over the last couple of weeks. Well, this deal where we can get out from under this debt and we can really begin to focus on ministry again, man, I've been praising God for that. Some people say, well, aren't you hurt? Aren't you, aren't you uh, uh, offended that all this? Nothing's going away. We're still here. We're, 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 we're all right. But we can shift our focus now and be what God's called us to be. We can begin to pour into other ministries within this community, people and lives, and make a difference for us. This is what God said. Listen, I don't want you to be, I don't want you just to have a name. I don't want you just to appear to be alive. But I really want you to have a fire of the Holy Ghost burning within the building. I want you to have an experience with the presence of God. This is what God God wants for his people. We don't have to be ashamed. We don't have to hang our head down. So, so this church made a, a great step out of the darkness of, 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 the, of the established church of that time. They stepped away from the darkness of that and they began to make that great step, but they failed to get back to the first love of the early church. Think about this, folks. We, we can do all we do within ministry here to try to establish ourselves and get ourselves. But if we ever lose that first love, and even if we get away from it and we don't get back to it fully, we're in trouble. We'll talk about that more here in just a moment. But, but, but they failed to get back to that first love. See, justification by faith was rediscovered, but the, but the blessed hope of the second coming, a spirit-filled life, a spirit-led life, the millennial kingdom, all these things were not rediscovered. 
Listen, the, 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 the first church, the early church, there was such an expectancy of the return of Jesus Christ that they didn't concern them things with the affairs of the world. I mean, they were so doggone uh, focused and determined in, in doing what God had called them to do. They, they didn't get distracted by everything else. They, they were healing people. They were raising the dead. They were casting out devils. They were preaching the gospel. And they, were, they, they didn't take concern for the life because they knew at any moment Jesus could come back. Now, thousands of years has passed, and now we sit in the church, and we talk about the coming of the Lord. And some people sit there like, yeah, I've heard this story before, but I'm telling you, your friend, he's coming. He's coming sooner than we think. Soon and very soon we're going to see a king. We're going to behold him in all his glory. And I'm telling you, friend, it's going to be not, it's not long from now. I believe we need to get excited about the things of God again. We need to get excited about the coming of Christ again. We need to get excited about the rapture of the church again. I'm telling you, folks, I sat in that funeral today and they began to talk about, Pastor Rose began to talk about that, 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 that uh, Fred was going to be the first one to get to go in the crowd. He said the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we which, are, we which are alive and remain shall be called up together in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Man, something began to bubble up inside of me. I said, oh, yes, Lord, even so, come quickly. I don't know about you, but there's an excitement inside of me to tell somebody that the Lord is coming. I'm not excited just about the workings of the church. I'm not excited just about the programs of the church. But I'm excited that Jesus is still king, that God is still on his throne, and that he's about to send his son to come and take us home. And it's all going to be worth it, folks, when we see him in all his glory when he steps out on that cloud and calls his children home. It's all going to be worth it, friend. All the stress, all the struggle, all the trials, all that stuff's going to be worth it when you hear that trumpet sound. Can somebody shout amen tonight? Glory to God, glory to God. you got to rediscover that. There were bitter debates and differences. They were the order of the day instead of unity and love of the early church. I thank God for what I feel in this house. I thank God for the unity and love I feel in this house. Listen, folks, I'm not naive. I know that we've got different backgrounds. We come from different ways of thinking, but we've begun to understand one another and love one another, even past some of our faults, even past some of our shortcomings. We've just gotten to love one another. Listen, I thank God that God's doing that. And let me tell you, you want to see a move of God, get a church that'll love one another, get a church that'll pray with one another, get a church that'll believe with one another, and all of a sudden you'll see God join in harmony with a church that's unified, and you'll begin to see a move of God like you've never seen before. I'm telling you, that's what it takes for him. we got to come together in one mind and one accord and then we can have a suddenly experience of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in a way like we've never seen before. All we got to do is come together. All we got to do is reason together and declare God we're going to love one another just like you loved us. We're going to forgive one another just like you forgave us. God we want one heart, one mind and we want to be one just as you and the Father are one Jesus. Oh my Lord help me tonight. It's not about debates and differences. It's about the kingdom. This is where they said this church began to miss it. They lost the focus of the kingdom. So he began in chapter two, or verse 2, rather, he began to, to threaten them and warn them. He told them in the first part of chapter, Revelation 3 and 2, be watchful. Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. He said, listen. You strengthen those things that are about to die. The truth of the gospel in this church was about dead. But the reformers, they helped it completely from dying during this period. He said, listen, I've not found your works perfect before God. The original Greek says, for I have not found of thee works having been fulfilled before my God. Let me say that again. If you go back to the original Greek, it says, I have not found of thee works having been fulfilled before my God. What, literally what God is saying, what Jesus is saying in his church, says, you've got works, but it's not works to fulfill the will of God. You're doing good things, but you're not doing God things. Are you with me? We, we, we can make all the plans in the world and do good things, but we need to do God things. Good things make you feel bubbly. And make you feel good. And it might even make your hair stand up. But God things come with an anointing. God things come with power. 
God things will break chains. God things will cause the dead to raise. God things will make the sick well. God things, listen, friend, when you begin to do God things, not just good things, but God things, God can turn a situation around like it never seen. Listen, I don't want to just have works, but I want to have works that are perfect before God because I've done what God has called me to do. Help me, Jesus. So, so the truth was being reformed, if you will. And as we've said, the reformers, they made a great step forward but they failed to get back to the first love of the early church. Their works were not fulfilled before God. Look what it says in Revelation 3, 3, the first portion there. He said, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. He said, hold fast and repent. Remember how you received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Jesus is literally challenging this church to complete the job that they begun. You've gotten the word. You've heard the word. The word's gone forth. Now take that word and hold it and repent. Folks, I'm telling you, daily when I get in the word, I get convicted. Da daily. Because I read in that word and I see my shortcomings. I read in that word and I see where I could do better. I read that word and I see where I could change. And it causes me to repent. And this is what he's challenging this church to do. He's saying to this church, listen, I want you to hear that word. I want you to receive it. That's all well and good. But hold it fast. Hold it fast. If you're good ground, man, let it sink deep in your soul. If you're fallow ground, allow God to begin to twist you and, and break you up and mold you so that you can receive the seed of the word and hold it fast. But he said, if you're going to hold it fast, repent. 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 He said, if you do this, then, then, then you've got to finish what you started. In the middle portion of this verse, he said, therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I come upon thee. Look at Revelation 16 and 15. He says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see is his shame. Matthew 24 43. The Bible said, But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He said, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Verse 3. He says this, For when they say peace and safety that sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you brethren are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Verse 5 you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. What was Paul saying here to the Thessalonian church? He said listen you know the Lord's coming. This thing's not going to overtake you. You know he's going to come like a thief in the night. He said be ready be ready, be ready, be ready. You don't know when the Lord's coming but you be ready. This thing is not catch, catching you unawares. He said, just like you can determine the seasons, you can also determine the signs of the coming of the Lord. I tell you, I look all around me and I see prophecies fulfilling everywhere. I see the Word of God coming alive right before my face. I'm telling you, the Lord is coming. I look up to the skies. I look up to the heavens and I think to myself, Lord, could this be the day? God, is that cloud the one you're going to step out on? When I ride down the road and I see the sunsets and the sun rises, I say, Oh, God, what a day for you to come and take me home. I'm telling you, friend, he's coming. He said, listen, if you don't understand this, he'll come upon you like a thief in the night, and you will be left. You'll be left. He said, hold fast to the word of God and repent. Repent. He promises this church some things. We're going to close up with this. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, the first portion there. He said, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. If you overcome, you'll be clothed in white garments. There's an old song I used to sing. In my robe of white, I will fly away. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it's coming today. He's going to give me a new robe. 
He's going to put a robe on my head. Listen, just like the father did the prodigal when he put a new robe on his back, put a finger on his hand and said, this is family. There's coming a day, listen, what that young man got was, was, was perishable. That robe was passed away. That ring, it got torn. But what God's going to give us is an everlasting robe, a brand new body, a brand new crown that one day we're going to lay at his feet. He's going to declare us to be sons and daughters and he's going to welcome us home. Listen, friend, I'm excited about that day. I know that it's coming soon. And he said, if you can just overcome, he said, I'm going to clothe you in white garments. I'm going to take away all the darkness. I'm going to take away all the dinginess, all the spots. I'm going to wash you in the blood of the Lamb. And I'm going to purge you of your sin. And I'm going to clothe you in white garments. What are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you tonight, press on. Don't let the devil bind you up. Don't you back down for anything. Press on. It's going to be worth it. If you can endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Glory to God. This marriage of the Lamb, it was said in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. He said, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Look what he's telling here. He said, listen, Christ promises that the overcomers of this church are a part of the bride of Christ. I've been a part of some weddings. I'm not a fan of weddings. I hate doing weddings. But there's one I'm looking forward to. Amen. There's a lot of weddings I don't want to be a part of. And there's been a lot more people I've told no than I've told yes. I can promise you that. In 25 years, I've, I've told a lot more people no than I've done weddings. I, I, I think I can count on both hands how many weddings I've done in 25 years. Not a fan of them. Don't care to do them because people don't take the commitment real. But that, that commitment that we've made to Christ, it's going to consummate itself in the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to get to behold Him in all His glory. We're going to be the bride of Christ without spot, wrinkle, or blemish that we can be presented to the Father as a glorious bride. A glory, listen, folks, this is what He wants. He wants a glorious bride. He wants us looking great in what we do and how we live our lives. I'm telling you, friend, this is what God is looking for. April 11th, 1995, at the Lincoln and Church of God, about 7 o'clock that evening, the music began to play. The congregation stood. Here come my wife walking down that aisle with her daddy at her own side. She had a beautiful gown on. It was pressed. It was spotless. It was without blemish. It was a little long. But she got through that. But I'm telling you right now, it's been about 22 and a half years ago, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. When she rounded that corner, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And all I could look up to heaven and say, thank you, Jesus. She picked me. Amen. It was a glorious day. It was a day I'll never forget. It was awesome to see her arrayed. It's such a beautiful vesture. But none of that compares. <laughs> none of that compares to the day when that trumpet sounds and God calls his children home. He adorns us and brings us into a home. Listen, folks, that he's been working on for thousands of years. You know what I think about? When I think about that, I think about in six days, God created everything that we look at that we stand in awe of. And for 2,000 years, he's been preparing a place. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. Seven, six days, he created all this. That Listen, as we rode into church tonight, just over the top of the church building, you could see the sun as it was sitting over the trees. And my wife said, oh, look at that. Ain't that beautiful? But nothing compares. In six days, he created all this. <laughs> in the first day, that sun that we beheld in all its brilliance and all its beauty, he just said, let there be. And it was. And so whatever he's been doing for 2,000 years, it's going to be mind-boggling. To the point that Paul said, I had not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered the heart of man all the things God has prepared for them. Woo, glory to God. Folks, could you imagine? And there are people that absolutely will sell their soul to the world and miss something that's going to be so marvelous when all they need to do is call out to Christ. And when grace and mercy, he'll cleanse them of their sin and their unrighteousness. And put their name in the Lamb's book of life. And when the trumpet sounds, they can go and heaven will be their home. But there are people that will sell their soul to the world and sell their soul to the devil. You say, well, preacher, I just don't know about that. Listen, the question is asked, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What if a man gain the whole world and lose his soul? 
You can have the riches of Bill Gates, but not have Jesus, and you'll be the poorest man that lives in this world. Amen. I might not have a dime to my name, but I've got Jesus, and I'm a poor, poor, rich man. <laughs> in this world standards, I'm poor, but in him, I'm rich. I'm rich. Amen. I, I run into a friend of mine at, at the, at the, uh, uh, the, the banquet the other night, and, and, and he was talking about how he was broke and all this other stuff. And, and, and finally he said, wait a minute, I'm not broke. My father owns the cattle of a thousand hills. I said, how many cows you got? He said, about ten. <laughs> I said, you got ten cows, you're doing pretty good. That's a lot of steak. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, you got to shift. And, and, and quit thinking from worldly mentality. Start thinking from kingdom mentality. And know that all your need is supplied. All your sicknesses can be healed. Amen. The dead things that were dead that need to stay dead to stay dead, but the things that need to come alive, God, is a resurrecting business. If you can just shift to that kingdom mentality, quit worrying about the worldly mentality, quit worrying about the things of the world, quit stressing yourself over what the world's expectations are, and just live up to the expectancy of God and His Word and obey His commands, and you'll find freedom and liberty and wholeness and purity and holiness like you've never seen before. If you could just shift to kingdom mentality. If you would understand that this world is not your home, you're just a pilgrim passing through. Folks, I'm telling you, this is what God's calling us to, to understand that if you, if you overcome, you'll be a part of the bride of the Lamb. But he continues in 3 and 5. And he said, he said, for those, I will not blot out his name for the book of life. If you overcome, I will not blot your name out. Now, for all the once saved, always saved people, if your name could be put in, and Jesus says that it can be put out. You got to be careful. I'm, I'm looking at you, but I should be looking at the camera. So all those people that, that, that believe that, that I got baptized when I was six, and, and, and I asked Jesus in my heart then, and I've lived like a devil ever since, but I'm okay because I did that when I was six years old. This verse here. If, if you're going to hang your verse, hang your hat on any other verse, hang it on this one. Because it's not, it's not unconditional eternal writing in that Lamb's Book of Life. He's got an eraser. He's got an eraser. So, so what you're saying, preacher, I gotta, I gotta work harder and I gotta be better and I gotta do good and I got no, no, no. You gotta put your full faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Know that He's the Savior of your life. Knowing that through Him you can do all things. In myself, I can do nothing, but through Him, I can do all things. And when I put my trust and my confidence in Him. And I trust him with my life every day. And again, I'm le living in kingdom mentality. And I'm pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. And I'm, I'm, I'm cleansing myself from the filthiness of the flesh. I'm abhorring that which is evil and cleaving to that which is good. Listen, I can go on and on throughout all the scriptures of the things that we're required to do. But yet God makes up the difference. In my weakness, his strength is perfected. I know that there's areas of my life where I'm weak. But it's those areas that I commit to him. And when I commit to him, he steps in and, and helps me in my shortcomings. He forgives me of my frailties. He helps me to stand when I can't stand on my own. God helps me. But there are things where I can make decisions and say, you know what, by God's word, by faith, I'm going to stay away from things I need to stay away from, lock myself away from things I don't need to be a part of, and I'm going to press into the presence of God. That's overcoming. That's overcoming. <laughs> Remember, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ that loved us. The Bible said that he has made us overcomers through the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen, my, 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 my victory is in him. My victory, my, my ability to overcome is in him. I, if I try to do it in myself, I, I've, I've already lost. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. So, so if, we, if we're approaching it with the mentality of I, I just got to, I got to do better, I got to do more to impress him. Listen, there's nothing you can do to impress him. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But at the same time, what we can do is surrender. Give all that we are. All our stuff, all our junk. And he's so faithful. He's so faithful. I, I, I'm, I, I'm walking a real fine line here because there's a lot of people that will say, well, well, you're telling me that I, I, I'm messed up and I'm a mess and God's going to understand that. And I, I, No, 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 that's not what I'm telling you. 
But at the same time, I'm not telling you that you you, you got to be so rigid and so, uh, you know, harsh and so beaten up on yourself that you're going to make yourself better. You can't do enough to make yourself better. It's, it, it, it is a line. It is a line. It's a straight and narrow line that leads to everlasting life. It's, so, so to understand that he said if, 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 if you understand, if you can overcome, I will not blot your name from the book of life, but I will confess his name. Small s, H, his name, talking about the person that overcomes, his name before my father, before his angels. So l- l- let's look at this for just a moment. Revelation 20, verse 15. He said, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So he says, if you don't overcome, I'll blot your name out of the Lamb's book of life. And then Revelation 20, he said, if your name's not in there, you'll be thrown into hell. Let that sink in just a second. So if you overcome, your name will be in the book of life. If you fail to overcome, your name will be blotted out. And anyone not found in the book will be cast into the lake of fire. How do I do this, preacher? How, how, How do I see this victory through? The victory has already been taken care of. Again, you got to get in line with the kingdom. More than that, you got to get in line with the king of the kingdom. In his word, in his promises, washed in his blood. And in doing that, he'll write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And on roll call day, he calls your name. This one's overcome. This sister's overcome. This brother's overcome. This is what he's called to. Anyone whose name is not written in the book, will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, this last portion in 3 and 5, he says, I will confess his name before my father. Look at Luke, Luke 12 and 8. Luke 12 and 8. He said, also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. At the funeral today, one thing that was repeated over and over and over and over again was Fred witnessed to, to people. I mean, it was, it was his lifestyle. To confess Jesus before men. That, that, every person that stood up, matter of fact, Ronnie Cartner got up to sing a song. And one thing he said, I, invi- I, I asked Fred to come over and do some work at my house. And he said, uh, he just walked in the door and started witnessing. He said, I called you over here to work on my watch, but not tell me about Jesus. He said, I wasn't living right. And he just, he came in the door and spent 30 minutes in my kitchen talking to me about Jesus. And he sang at his funeral today because he gave his heart to Jesus. Listen, folks, don't, don't ever think. Don't ever think that you just put here just to kind of walk a line and, and go through the most. No, friend. You're here to be witnesses unto him. Witnesses unto him. And he said, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before the angels of God. I will make your name known. If you will just testify of me. And listen, folks, it's easy in here because there's not resistance for the most part in here. But out there, to stand in a world where you say the name of Jesus and they curse you out. What do you do? You stand. You stand. The Bible said that you will be reviled for my name's sake. You will be hated of all men for my name's sake. You, you're going to go through torment and torture and tribulation and trial in this life. You're going to have it. He said if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they killed me, they'll kill you. Think it not strange my brethren, the fiery trials that come upon you. Don't, don't get discouraged in those. Look what they did to Jesus. And you're no, listen, I promise you, we're not as special as him. And they killed him. And so where we are, all we're called to do is to confess him before men. And preacher, you know, I've been witnessing, but I've not seen people saved. That the results are not your responsibility. You, listen, I told you Sunday. The, 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 the uniqueness of the parable of the sower of the seed was that that sower, he just sowed seed. He throwed seed. He hit all kind of ground. He just throwed seed. Listen, that's what we're called to do. Sow seed. We, 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 some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. The results are his responsibility, not ours. He's the convictor of hearts. You can't change a person, but he can. All you can do is sow the seed. Plant that seed so that the Holy Ghost can come along and water it and the conviction of God can fall and come alive. Listen, it'll make the difference. It'll make the difference. So what do we do with this? 
Revelations 3 and 6, he repeats the challenge. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I want to close with this thought. It's amazing to me that at the end of every one of these epistles to these different churches, Jesus uses the plurality of the, of the word church. He's speaking to one specific church, but he said, if you've got an ear to hear, you need to hear what God's saying to the churches. So, so what was meant specifically to Sardis was also meant to the broader spectrum of churches. And God is saying, listen, if I'm speaking it to Sardis, I'm speaking it to you. If we could go to Paul's writings, if I'm speaking it to the church at Rome, if I'm speaking it to the church at Philippi, if I'm speaking it at the church at Thessalonica, I'm not just speaking to them through Paul, but I'm speaking through Paul to them, to you as a church. That's the beauty of the Word of God. It does not change. It is not errant. It is not fallible. It is eternal. And what he said 2,000 years ago to those churches, he means the same thing to us today, that we should abide in that Word. Let it be a lamp to our feet. Let it be a light to our path. Whatever the Spirit is saying, hear what He's saying and let it change your life. He said, whatever you've heard and received, hold it fast. Hold it fast. Folks, I don't know, I don't know that I'll get to see you this coming Sunday. We're not promised to meet again on Sunday. Between tonight and Sunday, the trumpet of God could sound. God could call his children home. The scary part of that is this, is that maybe sitting here, maybe watching online, I don't know, but maybe, you know, there's some things that you need to bring back to God. Maybe there's some first loves that you need to recapture. Maybe there's some things that were in your heart at one time that that, that you were so filled with zeal for the things of God and you were so filled with the hunger and the desire for the things of God and yet it just seemed to wane as time went on. told you just earlier, I'm entering my 25th year of ministry. And I'm not saying this pridefully, but I'm just as passionate about preaching this word today as I was the first day I preached in, in, a, in a, a sermon. My wife has walked this journey with me for the last 20, almost 23 years. And she, she and I were talking about the other day, and she's seen me preach before hundreds. And she's pre- seen me preach before a few. I'm just as passionate about the word of God with a crowd as I am with a handful of people. I'm just as passionate about it one-on-one. I love the Word of God. I want to hold fast to it because it's my life. It's my source. It's my hope. I I don't want to lose the zeal. And I'm not going to lie to you, folks. There's things about, there's things about church that I'm not as zealous for. Are you with me? There, there's things, and when I say church, I'm not talking about Bible church. I'm talking about man church. There's some things I don't get as excited about. I used to get excited about some things, but I don't get as excited about it because I've seen the unfruitfulness of them. Are you with me? I've not, I've not, seen, I've not seen it bear fruit, and so I move on. There's been some things I've digged and dung and hoped that it would bring fruit. All the scholars know where I'm at here. But then if it didn't prepare fruit, it was cumbering the ground, it was time to move on to something different. Folks, this is, this is what we've got to understand. We're living in some perilous, perilous times. And the thing that's going to hold you, the thing that's going to keep you, I got, I got to get on the mic because the people are going to the line up here. The Word of God will never change. Hold fast. These, these messages, I've been preaching and other ministers have come and stood in this pulpit and preached. Hold them fast. Don't give up. Keep pressing on. You've got stuff that's pulled you backwards. You've got stuff that's hindering you. You've got things that hold Repent of them. I'm telling you. We bask in all the glory of this world. And again, for 2,000 years, he's been preparing a place for us. Why would you want to 
hold on to junk that you know the Word is telling you you can't hold on to that stuff and, and, and make it. Why would you want to hold on to that stuff? Let it go. Let it go. Repent of it. Move on. Forgive. Find healing. Find restoration. And move on to the greatness and the glory of God. Protect your name. Protect your name. If you overcome, your name will not be blotted out. But if you don't, you're, protect your name. There's some of us in here, we are vigilant to protect our earthly name. We, 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 stand at a, we stand at a place where we put our debit card in and we cover up and we do all this right here because we don't want nobody getting our identity. We shred stuff. We burn stuff. We do everything we can in this world to protect our name because we don't want somebody to steal what we got. Wouldn't it be awesome if we was just as vigilant to protect our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? My Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I'm telling you, God wants you to understand that He's written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now overcome. Conquer. Be vigilant. The heavens suffer violence, but the violent take it by force. You got, you got to fight the fight of faith. Just like Paul did. He said, I fought this fight. I kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge shall give me on that day, and I shall lay it at his feet. Listen, folks, it's going to be worth it. Fight your way through this stuff. Don't get deterred. Don't get distracted. Give your best to God and please him with your life. Watch God do marvelous things. Amen. I want us to, to pray. I, listen, don't just listen to me pray. If you've got some stuff you need to turn loose of, ask God right now. It, it, it doesn't take a, a, a grand parade to, to, to give it to God. That thief just turned around and said, Lord, when you get to your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. It, 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 it's, it, it's not a pop and circumstance to try to get you to make things right with God. Just right here in your prayer time, right here as we close in this prayer, you can say, you know what, God, there's some areas I need you to work on. If you just need to commit and say, God, I'm putting an under construction sign up and letting you do some work you need to do in my life. It might not happen all tonight. It might take a day or two. But you let God begin to do the process in you. And I promise you this. I promise you this, he will complete that which you've committed unto him against the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to complete it in your life if you give him the opportunity. Let him have it all. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Give it all to him. All right? Let's pray. Father, I, I, I'm, I'm praying for myself right now, God, not just for everybody else, but I'm praying for myself. God, I pray first and foremost that you search me and know me, try my heart, try my thoughts. God, see if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake, O oh God. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Create a clean heart in me, God. Renew a right spirit within me, I pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, then and only then would I be able to teach transgressions to error their ways. God, I, I, I want to be everything you've called me to be. I want to I want to operate at the peak, God, the pinnacle of what you called me to be, the anointing, God, that you've placed on my life. Lord, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be topsy turvy in my walk with you. I don't want to be uh, shallow in my beliefs and my my thinking, God, with you. I want to go into the deep things of God. I want to walk into the deep waters of you, God. I want to walk into places, God, that I've never walked before. I want to live on a level, God, I've never thought possible. God, I prayed for the sick. I've seen them healed. I prayed for the the deaf. I've seen them hear. I've I prayed for the lame, and I've seen them walk. God, I've, I've cast out devils. God, I, I've seen. I've seen you do some miracles, and God, it, it, it seemed to come in spurts, but God, I want to live in that place. I want to live in that place with that anointing. Like, like men of old, like Smith Wigglesworth and some of these other great men of God that I read about, God, that, that just has such a mighty anointing on their life. And I know, God, with that comes great sacrifice, great commitment. And God, I want, to, I, want to, I want to do my part to get to that level. I want to seek your face. I want to seek you while you may be found. God, I, 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 I've, I've cleaned my house up. There's some things I know that I was holding on to. And there's some things that I'm still surrendering, and there's some things I'm still turning away from. There's some things I'm still having to tell the devil no over. There's some things that I'm still having to, 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 to not relive, but let, let the dead things be dead. Take off the things that are shakable and let them be shaken away. God, so that I can, I can stand before you holy and blameless, pure, Pure in heart. God, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see you. 
God, that's what I want. I want to see you in all your power and your glory. God, and I know one day when the trumpet sounds, my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, I get to behold you then. But God, while I'm here, I want to behold you in all your majesty, your power, your anointing, your strength, God, that all you can give. And for this church and for these folks that are here tonight and those that are watching online, God, I want to see their lives so transformed. Whether they realize it or not, God, you, you have given us a, a rebirthing opportunity. You've given us the opportunity to start fresh. You've given us the opportunity to come clean and, 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 and be renewed and restored. Even recapture some things that were lost to go back to our first love. Thank you for that, God. You've been so gracious and merciful to us. I'm asking you, Lord, to, to help us to make the best of this moment. There are souls. There are souls that are dying and going to hell. Some of our family members, our friends, our co-workers. And God, they need to see. They need to see folks that are fired up for you, that love you, that are passionate about you. God, that, 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 that have a good name. Standing the way you call us to stand, God. I thank you, Father, for what you've done tonight. Thank you for these that are here. Thank you, Lord, that you're ministering to them. Thank you, Lord, for touching them and speaking in their hearts and their lives. God, thank you that you're going to make a way. You've been so glorious, so wonderful, so awesome. We can never thank you enough for the great things you've done. I give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. You're worthy of it all. We bless you tonight in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Everybody say it. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap, would you? Praise the Lord. I love you guys. Listen, some of you young bucks, some of you young men, older men, if you want to help, uh, I got to get those, uh, the, the doors, like these doors here, We, the, the extra ones we've got, we've sold those. Uh, so I got to get those loaded up in that trailer that's out there. Uh, I, I'll get it backed up to the door so we can do it as easy as possible. But uh, if you can hang around with me just for a few moments, it won't take that long. There's only about uh, 15 or 20 of them, so it shouldn't take that long to load them up. We got a cart that we can roll them out. But if you can help with that, I, I, I'd greatly appreciate it. And uh, otherwise, I hope you have a great, great uh, rest of the week. Continue to pray for those that are battling this sickness, this flu, this junk that's going around. Uh, please protect yourself. Take care of yourself. Um, and Lord willing, we will see you on uh, Sunday morning. And uh, if, if the Lord comes between now and then, I look forward to seeing you in glory. If, if you don't recognize me in my glorified body, I'll be the one hooping and hopping and shouting and hollering all the way down the riverbank. All right? That'll be me. All right, God bless you.